is it going to take for you to change? How great a thing does God have to do to capture your attention? Well, if you're like Jonah, God had to do a very mighty miracle to bring about a change in Jonah's life. Well, we left off last week in our study of the book of Jonah, and let's continue. Now, I'm looking at the Hebrew text, so it might be a verse off from yours, so you'll have to pay close attention to what's being read and not necessarily the citations that I give you. But in the Hebrew, we're ready for the first verse of chapter 2. And we saw last week that God is going to speak. He is going to appoint. He is going to move in many different ways. And in this book of Jonah, everything obeyed God except who? Except Jonah. And the first example of that is found this week in this great fish. Now, many people, they want to say that it's a whale, but actually... The scripture doesn't use that word for a whale. It just says a great fish. Well, look on chapter 2 and verse 1 in the Hebrew. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And it came about that Jonah was in the intestines of that fish for three days and three nights. Now, as I said, as followers of Messiah Yeshua, that term three days and three nights means something to us. We talked about last week about the sign that Messiah said that would be given, and that is the sign of Jonah. And why is that so important, and what is its reference? Well, keep reading. We read, and Jonah, he was in that belly of the fish three days and three nights, and what did he do? Verse, verse 2, and Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. Now, that's important. This was this man who wanted to flee from God. That is to say, he wanted no relationship with him whatsoever. He wanted to do his will. And what did he get? Well, he got exactly that. God put him in a place separated from him. And we're going to see that Jonah, and we talked about last week, how Jonah was going down, down, down. Well, his journey down had not uh, reached its lowest point. Because we're going to find out exactly where he went. But Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, prayer has to do with, with, with intimacy. Jonah not only spoke, but prayer, that Hebrew word is lahit palel. Why is that important? Why do I share that? Because the word lahit palel is in the reflexive, meaning back and forth. So it's not just Jonah cried out and that was it. Prayer is also listening to God. And that's what Jonah is doing. He's seeking God's response. So Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the, the intestines of that, of that fish. And he said, I cried out from my sorrow or trouble. Now, that's important because this one letter in the Hebrew attached to that word sarah is so significant. Why? Because it tells us why Jonah was made to, to cry out. What brought about this, this desire all of a sudden for him to pray? And what was it? Trouble. Now, when we look at some of the ancient uh, sages of Judaism, what we find is this. There is a piece of scripture in the book of Jonah, excuse me, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30 and verse 7, which says, Etzerahi leyakov, a time of trouble. That's that same word, affliction, hardship, it is a time of trouble for Jacob. Why would God allow that? Because God knows in the same way Jonah is an example of this. Remember, we talked about how Jonah kind of personifies Israel. So in that same way that, that God was bringing trouble upon Jonah to bring him to submissiveness, to capture his attention, in that same way in the last days, God is going to bring trouble and affliction upon the house of Israel in order that they might submit and end their rebellious spirit. So once again, verse, verse 3 in the Hebrew, I believe, verse 2 in the English. And he said, I called out because of my trouble. That was to me, I called out to the Lord. And he answered me, here's the key, from the, the belly of Sheol. Now why is that so important? Well, as we talked about, Sheol is the place for the dead. And Jonah here, 
You know, many people say, do you believe that Jonah could live three days and three nights in the belly of a fish? Well, that's not even a question. Why? Well, if you believe that God is able to do all things, of course, God could sustain him three days and three nights anywhere God wanted him to be. But the point here is here is that Jonah is in Sheol. Jonah died. Why is that so important? Because we're going to see that Jonah has a resurrection experience. Remember the connection. We find, and, and Judaism supports this, we see many places in the prophets where something is written, something happens, God moves in a certain way in order to reveal truth concerning the identity of Messiah Yeshua and what he's going to do. And in the same way that, that Jonah was lifted up and then he was cast into the sea, and the same way that Messiah was lifted up upon that tree and he was put in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, did Messiah really die upon that, that, that tree, that cross? Yes, he did. Did Jonah really die in that belly of the fish? Yes, he did. And therefore, in the midst of this, this situation, we read, and, and God answered me from the belly of Sheol, for I cried out and he heard my voice. And here's what we see. Jonah, he is speaking here about his situation. And he says, I was cast into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And the river surrounded me. And he's talking about what he went through prior to his death. And he says, the, the billows and the waves, they crashed against me. Verse 5. And I said, that which was, was cast against me. Before my eyes, he's saying, what was decreed against me? He says, but I will still nevertheless, look at the scripture. He says, nevertheless, I will look to the holy sanctuary. Now, that verse is so important. Because what we saw several times in, in chapter 1 is that Jonah was doing something. Jonah was fleeing from God. Wanted nothing to do with him. And now Jonah got his wish. Jonah says, if, if being with God, being intimate with him, serving him means that I have to go to Assyria and tell these people who I hate about what God is, the message that God's going to want me to share with them, I'd rather what? He says, I want to just break that relationship with God. I want to flee. I want to get away from him. And that's what happened. What the scripture is teaching us is this, that Jonah, he got his prayer. He was separated, that, that intimacy that he knew and he took for granted. That intimacy was broken and now Jonah is dead in that belly of Sheol. And when he experienced separation from God, what did he do? Well, don't miss it. He talks about all of this process of that he's going through, the waves beating against him over and over, the water rushing around him. And he says, nevertheless, I will still look to the sanctuary, the holy sanctuary. And the term here replies or relates to where God dwells. So Jonah, he got his wish. He was separated. And what did he want? It says literally that he yearned for the sanctuary. He wanted that intimacy. Move on. He says, the water encompassed me unto my, my, my soul. And he says, and the depths surrounded me. And the reeds, they, they covered my hand. And I went down very much so, he says, to the bottom of the mountains. I went down to the earth, to the very bars. And that word means the foundation of this world. And he says, but God, here's his request, that you might bring up my life. The Lord God brought me up from destruction. Now, there's two ways to understand this term destruction. One of it has to do with uh, destruction in a physical sense. That word is also used for, for a pit. And what Jonah is saying here is this, that God brought me up from destruction, physical and also spiritual destruction. And move on, he also says here, for I fainted, my soul fainted, but in the midst of that, when he had no ability, that's what fainting means, what did he do? He says, I remembered the Lord. And that word for remembrance is so important. 
The scholars tell us it's inherently tied to the covenant of God. Why do I say that? Well, if you look sometime in the book of Exodus, we see that the children of Israel, they cried out, they cried out so many years because of their affliction in Egypt. And finally, God says, I remembered. What did he remember? My covenant. So Jonah here understands that he has no merit in and of himself. He has fainted. He is dead. There's nothing he can do. So what does he grasp onto? One biblical truth, that he has a covenant relationship with God. So we see here that the Lord did what? He says, I remembered the Lord, and this prayer came unto him in his holy sanctuary. And because of that, God was going to move. And notice how Jonah is, is speaking about truth. He says, those who, who guard vanity. And what does this phrase vanity mean? The, the imaginations of, of one's thought. Those who, who keep their, their thoughts, their imaginations, their desires, their wills, what do they do? Well, it says that these individuals, they forsake God's grace. Move on to, to verse, verse 10. He says, and I with the voice of thanksgiving. Now, here's what I want to really emphasize. Jonah, he is dead. He is hopeless in and of himself. But he remembers that covenant and that covenant relationship, that, that promise and covenant. And we'll see this in the weeks to come. There is a, a connection between the biblical word covenant and the word promise, the promises of God. So even when Jonah has no merit in and of himself, what's he doing? Jonah is seeking these promises. He wants God to renew these promises in his life. So what does he say? Verse 10, he says, For I, in the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. Now, Jonah has gone through a transformation. God in this affliction that Jonah went through, when Jonah experienced the outcome of rebellion, that is death and separation from God, Jonah wanted to change. And here's the key. God gave him a, a second opportunity. And we need to be thankful, not only for the fact that God gives us second opportunities, but God, the scripture says, is not a, a respecter of persons, meaning that, that he will be faithful to his promises to all who call upon him. So look again, verse, verse 10 in the Hebrew 9, I believe in your Bible. He says, I, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. Now, what is that speaking about? Well, that word is used back in chapter 1. It's used in regard to those sailors who made a change who came to a greater understanding of the character and the revelation of the one true God. And in this affliction, this hardship, Jonah is as well growing in his understanding of God. We all need to grow. We all need to understand that we never get to the point where we know everything that we need to know about God. Verse 10 at the end. In the same way that he says, I will sacrifice to you. Notice the last part of that verse. And he says, and what I have vowed, I will pay. What's that phrase? Well, we talked about it last week. It has to do with commitment. So everything that Jonah is saying to God is the right thing. It's what God wants to hear from you and me. That is that we are willing to make sacrifices. That is to put our life on the side and to submit, to obey, and to take hold of the will of God. And this idea of, of making a vow and paying that has to do with, we talked about it last week, commitment. What Jonah is saying is this, I've learned my lesson. I am willing to make the sacrifice. I am willing to change, to put my will aside, my rebelliousness aside, and I'm willing to be committed unto you. For why? Well, look at the end of verse 12 or verse, verse 10. He says, for salvation is of the Lord. Now, that is so important because Jonah puts into the context this idea of salvation. And I would offer to you that when Messiah spoke to those leaders, 
concerning a sign and he spoke to Jonah, what he was telling them is this, that you've got to humble yourself. You've got to put your will, your ideas, your theology, your religiosity aside. And you need to understand that Jonah, just like Jonah was in a situation that he had no merit, nothing that he could point to and say, look at me, nothing that he could hold up and say, God, because of this, you must know. He understood that salvation is of the Lord. And those who maintain, remember what we saw earlier on, verse, verse 9, those who maintain their own convictions and their purposes, that's vanity, they forsake the grace of the Lord. End of verse 2 in the Hebrew, we read, and the Lord spoke, and this is another example of God commanding, God, God speaking, and everyone, everything obeys God. The question is, is Jonah. Is Jonah going to obey God? Well, notice verse, verse 11. And the Lord spoke to this fish. And what happened? And the fish vomited Jonah upon the, the, the land, upon the, the continent is the word. Now, what is Jonah getting? He's getting a second chance. But here's something very important. I want you to see that nothing changed. That is to say this, that God is not going to say, you know, Jonah, he didn't like what I was telling him to do. And, and, and he really endured a great deal. Therefore, I'm going to, uh, you know, make some changes in my plans. God does not make changes in his plans. He is sovereign. You say, well, well what about prayer? Doesn't prayer bring about change? Yes, it does. Prayer brings us to the purposes of God, his will. So what we find is that God's truths, they don't change. He doesn't alter them. His plans, his purposes, they don't change. You say, well, we're going to see in a few minutes about God making a change. Yes. And he takes that which is not his will. What's it not his will? Well, remember, we talked about a few minutes ago, what was going to be Jonah's message to the Ninevites? Many people think repent. It's not. Quite different. It's going to be a message of destruction. It's going to be a message of judgment. Now, here's a question. Was it God's will from before the foundations of the world to bring about the destruction of the people of Nineveh? No. God desires that all people might turn, they might repent, they might embrace God's grace, and that they might be healed and saved. So but when they don't, what's the outcome? God's judgment. And we're going to see because of the word of God, and that's so important, because of the word of God, the Ninevites are going to move in obedience. They are going to respond to divine truth. And what's going to happen? God is going to change, not his perfect will, but he is going to relent from the destruction that he never wanted to do, but evil demands. And he's going to go back to his original purpose. And we'll see that undeniably. Well, let's move on into chapter 3. And it came about the word of the Lord to Jonah a second time. And I want you to see, nothing changed. God brought about not a change in his word, but a change in his prophet. That the prophet hopefully would understand more about the truths, the nature, and the purposes of God. So chapter 3, verse 1. And it came about the word of the Lord to Jonah a second time saying, rise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, notice there was no change in location. And Jonah, well, he hated those people. Now, let me just point out to you something about the nature of the old covenant and the new covenant. For example, we talked about where this story began. When Jonah heard the plans of God, he went down to Yafo or Joppa in English. Now, that should cause us to think about another individual. You see, God oftentimes uses terms, places, and similar events in order to convey truth to his new covenant people. And I'm talking about Peter. Remember Peter when he was at this city of, of Joppa? And what happened? He received a call. He was up on that rooftop, and God gave him a call. And what was that call? To take the message of salvation to who? 
to the house of Israel? No, to the Gentiles. Those whom Israel had been oppressed by, who had they had fought, who had brought about great hardship for the Jewish people. And nothing has changed. We see the same foundational truth here. So look again, verse 2. Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And oftentimes we see, for example, in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem is called that great city. So why is Nineveh? Because God has a great plan for that city. He wants to bring about His presence, His revelation to those people. So rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call unto it the, the message. Literally, it's a word kriya, the calling which I will speak unto you. Now, what I like here is this. Up until this time, Jonah, he only thinks, he only thinks that he knows what God's going to say. In chapter 1, Jonah heard, go to Nineveh and speak what I'm going to tell you to speak. Jonah thought, well, this is going to be good news. This is going to be about his promises, about his grace and so forth. And because Jonah hated those people, he wanted nothing to do with that. But I want you to see what the scripture literally says about the, the message, this, this calling out from God. Call unto her, that city, the message which I will speak unto you, verse 3. And Jonah, he arose and he went to Nineveh as the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was a great city of God. Now this is important. A great city of God. What do the rabbis teach about this? That Nineveh had great potential. That God wanted to use these people for his purposes. That this city too belonged to God. They didn't have a covenant relationship, but God wanted to bring them into a covenant. So it says here, he arose and he went to Nineveh as the word of the Lord. For Nineveh was a great city unto God. It was a three day journey. Now, there's debate exactly what that means, a three-day journey, but no question, it was a large city. You, we, we've talked about the fact that the number three has to do with revealing something. So God wanted to reveal something to this city and the inhabitants of that city. And what was that? Look at verse 4. And Jonah began to call to that city on the first day. Now, the number one relates to God. And now we see something. What God wanted to do in this, this purpose that he called Jonah was to reveal to them God, God's nature, God's truth, God's, God's purposes. Why do I say that? Well, it gets very interesting. He says, and Jonah, he began to cry out on the first day after he had went one day journey. And he crawled out this. This is what God told him. Forty days and Nineveh will be what? Overturned. Now, that's not a message of grace. That's not a message of forgiveness. It is a message of the holiness of God. Why do I say that? Well, when we go back to chapter 1, what did we learn? We learned that, that Nineveh, that city, its evilness had risen up to heaven. That means that God was standing ready to judge it. And that's exactly what he says when he says, overturn it. And that word, la folk, means to overturn something, to bring it to its destruction. So this is what Jonah was, was hoping for. This is what Jonah wanted, a message of destruction. But what happened in the end? We'll move on. Jonah cried out in 40 days. Remember the number 40 has to do with change. Verse 5, it says, And the people of Nineveh, they believed in God, meaning they responded to a holy God that judges evil. Now, oftentimes we, we shy away from that. We don't want to talk about judgment. We don't want to talk about a wrathful God. We don't want to talk about things that are not pleasing to hear. But if we're concerned with bringing change, sometimes they need to hear the truth about what their lifestyle, what their theology what their philosophy of life is going to bring upon them, God's judgment. And when they heard that Jonah, now don't miss a very subtle truth. Jonah was an enemy. At this time, the Assyrians hated the Jewish people just as much as Jonah hated them. And now this prophet comes in and it shows something. 
it shows a, a, a self-denial. I mean, Jonah doing what he was doing was very dangerous. To go to the Enema and say, 40 days and this city is going to be destroyed. What do you think most people would do? They would hear that, that, that prophet, so to speak, this foreigner coming, pronouncing judgment upon our city. And what would they do? Well, they would say, let's kill him and see what becomes of his God. So it took great faith in Jonah to do just that. And it was that faith, that obedience, that self-sacrifice. Remember what Jonah says. He says earlier on, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to make a sacrifice. And when the people of Nineveh saw the faith of this one, I mean, only one who really knew God would do such a foolish thing as to march in to the heart of a great city, your enemy city, and pronounce what Jonah did. And because of Jonah's obedience, what happened? Look at verse, verse 5. And the people of Nineveh, they believed in God. And they proclaimed, here it is, a fast. Now, fast, when you hear that term, what comes into your mind? From a Jewish perspective, let me say from a biblical perspective, it's self-denial. It is emptying yourself of, of all that's you. Your thoughts, your purposes, your plans, your dreams, your hopes. It is emptying yourself totally and wanting to do what? Wanting to listen to God. And that's what the Ninevites were doing. They said, we need to change. We need to get rid of all that made us who we are. It was a great city, but it wasn't a great city in the purposes of God. It was a great city according to the perception of man. So they fast, they put on sackcloth, and it didn't matter, from the greatest of them to the least. And God's truth, it doesn't matter who you are, you may be important, you may not be. You may be wealthy, you may not be. But God's truth speaks to everyone, and each person must respond. Well, we'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you as you walk with the Lord.